Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 701. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's November 16th, 2021. All right, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. No, I'm not going to talk about it because you're going to see little icons popping up here. And a lot of you guys notice the, the timeline that's appearing uh, that will go to different sections of the, the, the video that you may want to see. Kind of some upgrades we added with episode 700. We're going to continue with them until somebody complains. But I'm just sick and tired of telling people to the program or the program or this to the program that's your job now you guys you guys can read we have a highly educated audience i hope you guys can handle it george i'm looking outside clear blue sky a little breeze out of the north which makes it a little colder and I, it's just some great biking weather here in florida it's beautiful yesterday i had my first afternoon off gosh since i don't know when and I spent it in, in the driveway to my neighbor's chagrin, putting a trailer hitch on my wife's car and uh, just tinkering and uh, doing all that sort of... See, in Florida, we're allowed to have old car seats on our front porch. You are. Uh, <laughs> a, I mean, uh, when I go biking, I, I, I bike over here in Webster and you, you drive by and there's like a new... Well, not new, it's another used Ford... Uh, F-150 from the 1960s on blocks getting, you know, wheels changed out. And, you know, that's how the, that's how they well, flow down here. Kevin, you, you need to be careful now that the weather is nicer and it's not as hot and humid. All those dogs who watched you cycle by, <laughs> they are now going to be awake and yeah. waiting for you yeah, they do. for a good run and chase. Uh, <laughs> you're, uh, you're the morning you're the morning exercise for uh, these hound dogs. Well, that's why when I travel... Uh, I carry dog meats, <laughs> and I carry a gel for nutrition, and a, a, this is my bike pump. It's an electric bike pump, and my little patch kit. And yes, mom, I wear a helmet. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it, it's interesting. I, um, the cool thing about living uh, the life we do is we get to uh, follow the good weather. So I get to bike a lot. Last year I biked 6,000 miles. I'm on course to bike another 6,000 miles for this year. Um, that's kind of the awesome thing about this lifestyle. The worst part of this lifestyle is when there's inflation, George. I, I went to the pump the other day and I'm like, yeah, to, to fill Monstro at $3.30 a gallon, that's the, the going price down here in Florida, that would be $330, George. Ouch. Ow. Ooh. So let's hope we can uh, you know, take care of inflation. Uh, pray, I'm praying for the president every day, George. Uh, lots of news out there. We have uh, good news stories. Um, there's lots of good news stories, and that's the cool thing. I don't know where you want to start. You were talking about uh, uh, the video that came out about Welby in Zimbabwe. You were talking about Nigel Sermon. Well, um, Welby in Ghana, I think that's a good news story. Let's talk. <laughs> Here, it's, it's George's day to choose. Which is the good news story you want to talk about? Well, I think I should start with what Justin Welby in Zimbabwe because I was unkind to him and I called him Gormless, which has two S's, I'm told, not just one in the spelling. Yeah. Well, for those uh, who are familiar, about two episodes ago last week, uh, there was some stories in the Zimbabwe State Press about a group of clerics from uh, Zimbabwe who had accompanied the presidents to the COP26 meeting in Glasgow, had ambushed Justin Welby, and was photographed giving Welby a petition calling for Britain to end its sanctions and boycotts against Zimbabwe. And the way it was spun in the Zimbabwe press was Justin Welby was sympathetic and was going to help them, uh, this and that. And the photos were not very flattering. There was a bright flash and his collar was askew and his mouth was slightly open and his ears were a little bit jugged. So it just, just bad it photos. It wasn't a perp walk photo, but it was really yeah. the, that 
caught in the, the deer in the headlights type folder, yes. Yeah. Well, somebody took a video of this exchange and surprise, surprise, the Zimbabwe state press was not being entirely honest. What they omitted to say was what Justin Welby said in full. Justin Welby was surprised by this group. He was ambushed. He did listen to their spiel. And he said, I will take this to the government. But then they cut out the rest. And the rest was, and I hope that the Zimbabwe government will stop taking advantage of its pe own people to rob them blind. Basically, he uh, stood up for the poor and the oppressed in Zimbabwe and basically told them, yeah, I'll hand this to the government, but don't, uh, don't, don't think I'm going to do anything to help you crooks. So the, the important part uh, was left off and Justin Welby did the right thing, in my opinion. He was polite, he didn't cause a scene, but he made them he made it quite well known that the Zimbabwean government's exploitation of its own people is a terrible thing. Well, Zimbabwe has a long history of robbing its people and enslaving them. Uh, if, if, if I could use a better term, I would. Um, and you, one of your first visits to Africa was Zimbabwe, George. Uh, it, it hasn't changed a bit. It's gotten worse. It's gotten mm. worse. <laughs> I was first there in the 90s, and even I was never there under when it was Rhodesia. I was too, uh, too young for that. But I was there when it was Zimbabwe, uh, New Zimbabwe, and where the uh, commercial farms were still in operation, and it was still a thriving. There was a corrupt government, but the government left the uh, commercial sector alone. So beautiful hotels. Be I mean, it was a sophisticated, very nice place, Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And I, in the past, had heard people had retired from England to Zimbabwe and South Africa. And I think, why would you do that? And then I went there. And on a very little money, you could live very well. That's all changed, uh, completely changed. Anybody who can get out has gotten out. Those who are left, one of the saddest things, and I saw that my last visit, is there are these nursing homes uh, of uh, English settlers, or maybe second generation settlers from England who came out after the Second World War. They may not have children or their children have left. And they basically live, these people that we have nursing homes around here, they, they're in their 80s, 90s, and they live hand to mouth with no medication, basically starving to death, abandoned by the world in what is now a hostile country where they've lived almost all their lives. Um, there's some charities that uh, assist the people, as well as Commonwealth war veterans and people who are impacted by Zimbabwe's destructive uh, <sighs> persecution of all their people. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's just such a shame because Zimbabwe, I could see the potential the country had even after it was independent from uh, from its it original set. Has amazing natural resources, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a beautiful country with beautiful people. Um, that you it's just like, just corrupt polit just yeah. corrupt politicians at, at every level, and it, the corruption grows the higher up in the politics you get there, uh, to where the the president was taking out hundreds of millions of dollars uh, right off the top. Yeah. I, re I remember in 1998 uh, at the World Council of Churches, uh, or was it 99? Oh, 98, 99, World Council of yeah. Churches uh, Assembly. It was held in Harare. And I was down there as a reporter. And in the middle of this, this English delegate named Michael Nazarali had a heart attack. And I uh, remember Michael was taken to the hospital where he was treated by a good doctor and he was stabilized and he was eventually airlifted home today those same hospitals are basically empty shells mm -hmm. uh the doctors have all left if you're a patient you go to the hospital that means your family has to bring food you have to pay medicines which are supposed to be free from the state you go to hospitals to die when you're alone you don't go to be cured yeah. But once upon a time, they had hospitals that were good enough to treat a major heart attack and stabilize. It's just like around here. If you have a heart attack, you go to a local hospital. If it's bad, you then airlift it up to uh, Gainesville or south to Tampa. Um, all that's gone. No, it's, you know, well, 
we live close to the villages. They have a trauma one uh, emergency room over in the villages. I wonder why. <laughs> uh, so one of those things. Um, Welby is also in the news again uh, because of a conversation he had with the Archbishop of Ghana this week that was kind of made pre uh, public by the Archbishop of Canterbury. And he put out a statement saying, I talked to the Archbishop of Ghana. I talked to some of the senior bishops on the conference call. And then I was waiting for the second paragraph to say, and we discussed how wrong they were and they repented and everything is well with the Anglican communion. That's not how the second paragraph turned out, George. I, as a reporter, uh, had my expectations completely rebuffed, and I watched the Archbishop of Canterbury walk back his previous comments to, like, what are you doing? Listen down script on the inside here? Because uh, this is what we told you. You know, that you don't have the power to influence Ghana in any way, shape, or form. And all the, the noise you're making from the West is just making it worse for laws that will never be enforced. So George, back us up a little bit as to why he was having this conference call with the, the Guyanese and uh, what was the result? Guyanese are in South America and Guyana. Ghanaians are across the Atlantic and Africa. Oh, I would never make that mistake, what? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Um, well, the Ghanaian church, Anglican church in Ghana, it's 11 dioceses, maybe 12 by now, there's one in formation, yep. has backed a bill before the Ghanaian parliament, the, the Ghanaian family values bill. And parts of this, and this bill was written in response to Western, specifically EU and British meddling in Ghanaian society, where the government agencies and NGOs would fund uh, gay and lesbian affiliated and transgender focused projects in Ghana. Now, Ghana is a culturally very conservative country and the chiefs of Ghana, which is uh, that they still have the chiefs are a force in the country, mm -hmm. put, put together a protest, which was picked up by Ghanaian legislators who wrote this bill and they updated the 1963 Ghanaian sodomy laws. I'm not being pejorative, that's what they're called in legal terms, laws dealing with unnatural vice. And these, and it was changed from, the act of sodomy was changed from a three-year misdemeanor to a five-year felony, and for promoting, uh, you could be sentenced to up to 10 years as a felony. So, in essence, the laws were being stiffened from felony misdemeanors to felonies. However, if you apologized and said you wouldn't do it again, the judge had the discretion to remit all penalty if you promised to be a good boy or girl. Pause for a second. Laws mean different things in different parts of the world. And the English liberal response to this was hysterics. Ghanaians persecuted, oh, this law will see people jailed, this, that, and the other. They had these laws in the book with the different penalties since 1963, and no one was ever imprisoned. No, zilch, nada. The law, laws, see the English, I hate to say this, are really anal retentive about laws. They're the only people, besides I think the Germans, who follow every followed every jot and tittle of EU law when they were part of the EU. Do you well, think the Italians uh, follow the laws? Well, you said that laws are interpreted differently around the world. Islamic countries are a little more strict with their laws, including sodomy laws, than you would find in Ghana or most parts of Africa, uh, except where the Islamics have taken over Africa. So, y yes and no. Um, I can think of lots of places where I would be fearful for my life if I were trying to act upon sexual attraction. It laws, for want of a better way of describing it, laws such as these are sort of the akin of your of your mother saying, "Wait till your father gets home." Um, they are threats. They're not actions. They can be turned into actions if the state 
or if the powers to be decide that a specific person or group need to be made an example of for cohesion of the culture. But no, the Ghanaian sodomy laws are not akin to what we would have in the Western countries. They are more of an expression of cultural outrage at colonialist mindset of the Europeans telling the Ghanaians how to run their country. That being said. So these laws are being debated. Um, these get picked up and in England and the left goes bananas, issues all sorts of denunciations and the usual suspects begin calling Justin Welby and tell him he must act because this violates Lambeth 110, which recognizes we're called to love all people, including homosexuals, and respect their dignity and this and that. And so Welby issues a statement at the beginning of November denouncing the Ghanaian church's support for this and reminding them that it violates Lambeth 110. After Lelby, Welby speaks, the second tier bishops all hop in and the Ghanaian press responds by attacking the English for being imperialists and you get your house in order first before you tell us what to do. You know, it's, it's a tit for tat thing. November 4th, Justin Welby holds a Zoom conference, video, audio video conference with the leading Ghanaian bishops including Archbishop Cyril, and his last name is Ben, and then hyphen Smith, mm -hmm. Cyril Ben Smith. That was November 4th. A week later, Justin Welby issues a press release from Lambeth Palace saying he has talked with the Ghanaian bishops about this, and then he starts off backpedaling. I should have uh, discussed this first, I'm sorry, November 3rd, I met online, not November 4th. I should have discussed this before I spoke publicly about the issue. And essentially, I'm sorry for having spoken without uh, thinking. We affirmed Lambeth 110. And one of the things that uh, the English liberals forget is that Lambeth 110 besides recognizing the dignity of all people, homosexuals mm -hmm. included, says uh, homosexual conduct is incompatible with the uh, Christian faith. And what they specifically forget in England these days is that conversion therapy, i.e. prayers for those with homosexual inclinations and actions and are good and work and efficacious, that people can be changed through prayer. We've got people like the Bishop of Birmingham, I think it is, who's saying we should make that criminal. Well, that's laid out clearly in Lambeth 110, uh, that that is something that the church should be doing to pray for people who are so afflicted. So in a major surprise to me, and as Kevin mentioned himself, Welby backed down. He said he was sorry for speaking. He affirmed Lambeth 110 with the Ghanaians and hoped that this wouldn't hurt relations between the two churches. Well, I want to read one of the paragraphs that came out in the press release. Um, and here's Justin Welby saying, this was a conversation between equals. I have no authority over the Church of Ghana, nor would I want any. I say that partly because of uh, Britain's colonial history in Ghana, but also because of the very nature of the Anglican Communion. And that's what we're trying to talk about here is you know, everything that happens in politics is usually a reaction to something else. And what you're seeing happen here in Ghana is a reaction to this history of colonialism that they're kind of sick and tired of. Uh, most of Africa is very sick and tired of the EU, of the World Health Organization, and all others trying to push westernization on these countries, even though colonial times are supposed to be over. Britain had set these countries free. What's going on here? Germany had set these countries free. I mean, why are you still trying to influence us? Can't we be autonomous? Well, yeah. we made Germany set their colonies yeah, free. Did. <laughs> they didn't do it on their own. No, uh, but thank God we did. You know, and yeah. so you, you just have to sit here and understand that uh, where Tip O'Neill would say all politics are local, I'm here. 
a lot of things happen as a reaction to other things that are happening around the world, especially in post-colonial Africa. One of the things I, I want our viewers to understand is that we're going to get the odd nut or two who comment, uh, who hasn't listened to what we're saying, who basically say, oh, you support the law. No, we're not saying that. Mm -hmm. We're trying to explain the thought processes and why this is actually happening. Ghana was called the Gold Coast before independence. In 1960, it became the first independent indigenous African country. South Africa, of course, was first, but it wasn't indigenous. And Ghana, Ghana has a very strong national uh, identity based upon it being the leader in breaking free from European influences. It was one of the leaders of the old non-aligned movement, which in the 70s tried to forge a way between the Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc. And now if you have the English and the Europeans, the French, the Germans, the Swedes and whatnot, stepping back in and imposing their worldviews on the Ghanaians, it pushes not only a religious button, because Ghana is a very fervently religious nation, mm -hmm. uh, be they Christians or Muslims, they hold their faith very fervently. But it also presses the religion, religion button as well as the national cultural button. Who are these people to tell us how to think and what to say? And why aren't they telling other nations who are more egregious what to do and what to say? China, Russia, Cuba, Venezuela. I can go through a dozen off the top of my head of places that are extremely hostile to the gay and lesbian uh, politics and to those who are um, caught in the act. And not and Ghana is not that top of the list. It doesn't even make the you, list of the top 20. Friends, you have to remember that when Fidel Castro was alive and running Cuba, homosexuals were exiled to the Island of Pines, the Island of Youth, which mm -hmm. is the big island to the south of Cuba, uh, near the Bay of Pigs. And we're because Castro had a visceral hatred of homosexuals. And do you think the liberals in the West ever said boo about that? Of course not. Um, but again, have to underhear us when we say that a Ghanaian law is akin more to a Ghanaian cultural practice than it is to a Western understanding of a binary system of right and wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so you can't, they're not necessarily, uh, they're not even, I think, in the same category. They're in the same subject heading of law, but they're different types of understanding of how laws operate and they're, uh, it's just this, it's like Kevin and I are very libertarian type Americans. And we're very different from some of the English people we've met in our attitude towards uh, self-independence, self-reliance, what the state can and cannot say to us. We come from an, I'll, I'll speak for me, I come from an attitude is that the state doesn't grant me any rights. God has given me these rights and we delegate some authority to the state. Not the state saying I have this right. What's the state got to do with it? But that's just an American, uh, one, one type of American perspective. Mm -hmm. The frontier mentality, I guess you could call it. Yeah, well, we were brought up to understand that uh, the people give the state its rights, the federal government's right. It, it comes from us. Mm -hmm. uh, the federal mm -hmm. government uh, is uh, beholden to our desires and that the federal government works for us. We don't work for the federal government. Um, that's just our understanding as Americans and the basics of the U.S. Constitution. If you want to read the first four paragraphs, you'll get a good understanding of the Constitution. If you want to read uh, our, our Declaration of Independence, uh, first paragraph will tell you exactly, you know, that, that mindset that we, the people, um, are setting up this government to be a government of the people for the people. Now, for, for non-Americans, you may have heard like a third of New York City policemen and 40% of Los Angeles firemen, firefighters have refused to take the COVID vaccine. And you would think, well, why are these, you know, flat earth hillbillies? Well, these are New Yorkers. These mm -hmm. are people from LA. And, you know, police and firefighters are very well educated, very highly trained. They're not 
ignorant. But the idea that the government has authority over you in areas that you did not give that authority grant to the government in the first place is highly offensive to large sections of the American populace. So it's not anti-science so much as it is um, response of anti-human that somebody else is saying how you can live and how you can be. And that's why nobody was surprised to see uh, Biden's mandate for vaccinations not make it even to the third level of courts. An appeals court here um, in America said, no, what do you, you can't mandate a vaccine to, to have employment. That's ridiculous. Now, I think our also viewers need to hear is right. Kevin and I both have been vac vaccinated. Our families have all been vaccinated. I am pro-vaccine. I am anti-mandate. Exactly. Yeah. You're exactly right. And I think that's, that I think probably is the majority of American opinion right now. Mm -hmm. It's when you're compelling people we all, I have a, a kooky rel relative by marriage, who's one of these people who basically the whole family had to gang up on her to immunize her children when they were little because she had this thing that vaccines could cause uh, autism. Well, the risk of autism versus the risk of measles, uh, yeah. all these other things for yeah. a small child. Um, so, I mean, we're, there are people like that. I'm not saying there aren't, but the majority of people in my experience, who are opposed to vaccine, vaccines are opposed to the mandates, rather being told you have to do this, mm -hmm. rather than the science behind it. Well, let's move on. We have covered those topics quite well. Um, where are we? We're at 27 minutes. Good. We can still cover all our topics here. Uh, you want to talk about Nigel uh, uh, from Oxford. Was it Oxford? Yes, Nigel oh, Bigger. Okay. Yeah, and this is important because right now immigration is a topic worldwide. Uh, legal and illegal immigration is happening here on the American shores. It has for the longest time. It makes the news when there's a Republican president. It doesn't make the news when there's a Democratic president. But now we're seeing immigration taking over on the borders of Poland and Belarus. And uh, right now, Britain is having a trouble with people coming over on boats and uh, uh, being Ill subject to Ill illegal immigration. The Bible is clear how uh, christians should treat immigrants we need to take them in and treat them as neighbors and brothers and sisters the bible is also clear that you know governments can have laws and you know we as uh citizens you know need to support a government that has laws and if our go if our government says we only allow a million immigrants in legally a year and we want to support the countries with which they're coming from so they don't feel they need to necessarily come here for financial reasons we should support that but i want to be very clear our we are commanded to treat immigrants and illegal immigrants as neighbors as christians separate from what happens na nationally however this uh, uh professor here nigel makes some good points that i thought george would certainly want to talk about in a such immigration is going to always be a worldwide not just an american problem so let's talk george well niger nigel bigger is an anglican cleric he's a priest he is the regis professor of moral philosophy at oxford mm -hmm. he's a moral theologian he's an ethicist he has forgotten more than kevin and i will ever know on this topic he is also uh on uh, he wouldn't accept this uh, line but he is conservative which means a generation ago he would have been slightly liberal left to center but today that he hasn't moved society has and now he's been condemned as being racist by students at oxford he gave a sermon at christ church cathedral in oxford in october where he talked about a christian perspective on immigration the text of the sermon is on anglican inc and i really encourage you to read it what bigger did was he started out by saying by raising the topic, some would automatically, reflexively call him a racist. And by doing that, you're basically doing no service to uh, intellectual thought or discussion. So just by, dis you cannot dismiss concerns about immigration as racist without yourself being 
dismissed as being a zealot of some sort. Second, Bigger said, we need to acknowledge, I'm going to read now, his summary, acknowledge that our care should extend beyond accepting political refugees to addressing the conditions that impel migrants to take the risk of leaving their own countries in the first place. Bigger is saying, yes, political refugees, people who are in danger in their own countries for the political leanings, should be brought into this country. But we should spend as much, if not more time and effort addressing the conditions that drove them from their countries. Third, Bigger says, illegal economic migrants, people that leave countries to come to work in other countries because their standard of living will be higher, should be returned. This is true of, say, South Americans, Mexican Americans coming into the United States who are economic migrants. They should be returned where they came from. And Bigger's argument is that this this may seem uh, unchristian, but there are multiple duties a Christian must exercise. Beyond compassion, there's the duty of justice. We have a duty to the poor and the working class in our own communities. Bigger notes that while for the upper middle classes and the chattering classes, illegal immigration means cheap housekeepers, cheap gardeners, uh, pleasant uh, baristas at Starbucks, it means loss of jobs, scarce housing, and less opportunity for the poor in our own society. And we cannot outsource the hard decisions of how we treat our own poor by basically flooding our country with new poor. So we are called, Bigger basically says, to do justice to all parties, not just have this knee-jerk reflectiveness that immigration is good, laws against it are bad. Now the result has been that Bigger has been tarred and feathered by the liberal professoriate and the hysterical student groups. But I really am so happy, proud, excited that Bigger is talking common sense about immigration. As he says, as Kevin says, we have a duty to care for people, but that is not necessarily the same thing as we have a duty once we've cared for them to basically give them uh, a house and a subsidy for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's, I mean, we've talked recently about the, the, the failure of American politics in Afghanistan, in other countries around the world, where we try to uh, impose our version of democracy and oops, turn the microphone over, sorry people, where we're trying to uh, offer these countries our version of democracy, and we're surprised that they don't want it. They don't want the freedom, you know, to bring up their own people in a in a free society and have westernized jobs and uh, our understanding of freedom. This surprises us, um, and so we'll have these big political um, drop balls like Afghanistan, Iraq, and, and other places where we want to be sure that we offer what we've learned over the centuries that there's nothing wrong with allowing people freedom and autonomy and to uh, have access to capitalism and have access to a, a place where within their own nations they can uh, become unimpoverished you know it, it, it and that's what we want to try and build up we don't want a world where you're forced to leave your country which you love and which is uh, a great uh, place to, to raise your family, if it were just economically better, if we can help influence that. Sadly, all our influence dollars come with agendas now. If you want uh, money from the World Health Organization or the United Nations or any, any of, of the other dozen places, you have to accept their gender politics. You have to accept the, the rubber stamp of their morality, not just their freedom. And that's hard for other countries. Uh, I, I, <laughs> Afghanistan is sick and tired of the West and our uh, gender politics. And they, there's going to be refugees in that type of situation. They don't want the money and the politics. One of the dark secrets of the Episcopal Church was up until the 1970s, the Episcopal Church was an agent of acculturation in the United States. If you open up a clergy directory for any diocese and you run down the list of names, they will not all be only Anglo-Saxon names. 
you'll see Polish last names, Hispanic last names, German names, uh, names of Asian origin. The Episcopal Church, uh, you know, for s decades ran programs in the great migrant cities to teach people English, teach them civics, to bring them into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, as well as to make them part of the melting pot that is the United States. Mm -hmm. Current immigration policies by s some on the left are that you need no longer acculturate when you come to the United States. You can preserve the culture that you had in Pakistan or in El Salvador and keep it in a little enclave in America. I think that is very, very wrong, and I support government policies that encourage acculturation, encourage raising people from the immigrant base into uh, a native American base, not, I mean, that by Indians, but those who identify as Americans within one generation, the second generation. And, you know, we've got this terrible story that we really don't know that much about because it's just first press reports and first press reports are always wrong always where we had an economic immigrant from syria who went to britain and was and evidently converted to christianity from islam and used that as a reason why he shouldn't be deported back to the middle east because he'd be persecuted for having renounced islam well, on Sunday morning, Remembrance Sunday, which is the, in the Commonwealth is their Veterans Day, marking the First World War anniversary, this fellow uh, basically wired a bomb to himself and asked a cab to take him to Liverpool Cathedral, where there was going to be a Veterans March after the service, the same cathedral where he had been baptized as a Christian. And the taxi driver knew something was wrong and hold of the car, locked the fellow in, and the fellow detonated the bomb. And this heroic taxi driver uh, saved who knows how many people would have been killed if this fellow with his vest bomb had gotten out into the uh, marching masses of the veterans. Um, the last, you know, the MP was murdered uh, in, uh, I think it was early, late September, early October, by a Somali migrant. Um, Britain is, you know, we may have a different migrant problem, uh, which is not as bad because me, uh, most Mexicans, me, most South Americans acculturate readily and rapidly yes, Absolutely. into the American culture. That's not an issue. Mm -hmm. There are a few who become radicalized, but the vast majority acculturate. We're not seeing that with migrants from the Middle East and Central Asia. South Asia in Britain. And this is what lies behind one of the things that uh, that Nigel Bigger is writing. Um, well, I, but I also want to bring up another point in all this. Immigrants illegal and legal in America know that this is the land of opportunity. They know mm -hmm. that this country is not as racist as the press would have you believe. They know mm -hmm. that... Uh, this society offers freedom and a chance that they can come over here with just pennies in their pockets and get a job or start a business or go to school. Um, I know this because so many people in my life from African countries who have dark skin have come here legally and some illegally and have gotten the American education post high school. Uh, and have gone on to be doctors and lawyers and businessmen. Um, I can think of the Ugandan, the Kenyan, the Nigerian, who've come here and have succeeded greatly by the freedoms that this country offers because it is not racist in any way, uh, in the way it used to be. Um, it, so people look for opportunity and they're willing to risk their lives to come here to America to do that. That's, that's amazing. And that shows me that this country is not as bad as uh, the liberals and the media would have me believe it is. Um, people still risk their life to come here. And as such, can we find a way that we can operate these same opportunities in their countries? 
so they don't have to flee. And I can think of the Venezuela, I can think of the Haiti, and I can think of other places recently where people have f tried to flood America from these countries. What can we do there? Well, sadly, there's just levels of corruption. We put, you know, almost a billion dollars into Haiti since the earthquake, more than that, I'm sorry if, if I'm a little under. It's all gone to corruption, it's gone. It's, it's, it's in the pockets uh, of politicians. So it's made its way back to Miami in expensive <laughs> villas. Yes, along uh, on the Gorse Island. You know, and, uh, Bill and Hillary have done well, but in as such, it's so hard to uh, financially improve other countries by just trying to hand out money. It doesn't work that way. And we tried sending the Marines into uh, Haiti for twenty odd years yeah. at the beginning of the last century. We saw we tried to by Haiti. And until Haiti decides that Haiti wants to change, um, and we can, we have seen this happen. We've seen South Korea, for instance, which had nominally, basically was no better off than North Korea throughout the 50s. In the 60s, took off, and now it's one of the major wealthiest nations in the earth. Singapore, Hong Kong, before the, before the current unpleasantness. There are, uh, you know, there are ways to raise yourself out of poverty, and it's by capitalism and by investing in people and infrastructure and education, not anti-American uh, gender studies education, but well, education that improves the commonwealth, the common weal. The, if you look at the, the leading stories today, Cuba is marching again. The, the Cuban people are still seeking freedom, they're still seeking some type of intervention in their communist country. And uh, sadly, it's just, it, it, because the communism is so pervasive down there and so brutal, they can't get the spark to start. They're trying to get that spark so that, you know, we can have our marches, so we can finally offer something to this country that hasn't been here in a long, long time, ever? Yeah, it was there. Capitalism was healthy there, oh well. And so, you know, you see these places around the world, you see the Arab Spring that happened uh, years ago. What does it take? And I, I want to let you know that money isn't the solution. Time may help. The, the being a good example of freedom may help. Uh, but also being that shining light on a hill here, that shining city uh, that America is as the land of opportunity helps. We want to make other places the place that people want to go. How do you do that? Well, Kevin, you did. You cited America started off as a socialist nation. The Pilgrims started off as socialism, holding things in common, and all this and that. What it a failure! It didn't work. It didn't work. No. Yeah. And they rejected that. And now there are lots of sociological theses on this point, but it's called the Protestant work ethic that God wants you to work hard. He wants you to be successful. He wants you to be wealthy. It's not that it's a sign of God's blessings. Not, we're not talking about the prosperity gospel, but that you should work hard. And if, if you're called in life to dig a ditch or peel a potato, you do so to the glory of God. If you're called to be a banker, you do so, but you charge fair interest rates. You don't cheat your customers. You have integrity in your profession. That's the Protestant work ethic. And it's one of the reasons why the Industrial Revolution and wealth began in Northern Europe and the United States and Canada and Australia and those places before the rest of the world caught up. That's why South Korea, uh, which has a very vibrant Christian church, uh, took off. Japan is a, an outlier. Japan has a very minuscule church, but it adopted the Western cultural mindsets that lay behind the Christian ethos of the Protestant work ethic. Still has one of the highest si uh, suicide rates of any nation. So, um, okay, we, we've talked that to death. Uh, <laughs> this is a Christian show, and I'm more likely to talk about adult baptisms, the capitalism, but I want to talk about this in kind of the, the world political scene, which the church finds itself in. How do we also evangelize in this? in the time of legal and illegal uh, immigration. Um, you know, the, the church has to be very cohesive and um, work hard now. 
uh, harder than you ever had before because now we're going to start to see hyperinflation worldwide because all these trading routes and uh, all the things that used to work well uh, 18 months ago, 20 months ago, don't work at all anymore. Try order something on Amazon. <laughs> but we could discuss that some other time. George, funny story that we're going to finish up with. And uh, I say this because I was probably a child uh, up until middle school who needed a spanking or two from a teacher. I was the smart aleck in the back of the room. I was kind of a troublemaker, not the class clown. No, 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 no. But, oh, I gave teachers high blood pressure at times. And I, I repent now of my, my, my youthfulness. Um, but I would get, never got spanked. That was even, you know, in the late 60s and 70s, whatever schools my parents were sending me to, they didn't spank. Got a ruler once well, that, was that was Minnesota. That was Minnesota. They're all sweet. They're all kind and sweet and hardworking Protestants up in Minnesota. <laughs> and so, I, but now somebody says, hey, why don't we try corporal punishment again, George? What's the story there? Oh, uh, the Archbishop of Kenya, Jackson Ole Sapit. Uh, Andrew Gross has corrected my mistake of many years of calling him Sapit. It's Sapit. So thank you, Andrew, for getting that right, for me getting finally getting that right. We appeared on the Kenyan Broadcasting Corporation's KBC, and he said, we have a problem in our schools of indiscipline. And that is now being compounded by the difficult political atmosphere in which we find ourselves. There are going to be general elections next year. And Kenyan just general elections are very tribal and they get very messy and they get very bloody. And that Eight years violence, ago, they had a, 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 a mini revolution over a, a bad election. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, what do we do? Jackson Olisa Pete's uh, view is we need to bring back caning. Teachers should be able to cane unruly students to improve, to. Uh, impose order and discipline. Nip it in the bud, the uh, the normal student uh, frivolousness and uh, bad behavior, as well as political behavior, as well as all these things, and force them to finish their algebra homework on time and memorize their times tables and all this stuff. So the ch church in Africa, again, this is a cultural thing. Corporal punishment is culturally appropriate in an African in most African settings and it's only under the influence of Western educator at Western educators in the past generation that most African state schools uh, abandoned corporal punishment um, and they're finding that was a, a bad move because the Western mindset that you saw in Minnesota where uh, we're going to talk to the child and reason with the child. It didn't work when you had one teacher with a classroom of 60 kids. Uh, so they're, so the archbishop, and this has been met with pretty much universal support among parents, among ordinary Kenyans. There's some westernized Kenyans say, oh, no, no, this makes us look uh, uh, <coughs> savage and uncultured. but. It has just been met with great approval. Uh, it's akin to the popularity that a few years ago there was a movement to reintroduce uniforms into public schools in some part in some cities, so to break up the uh, problem of uh, violence over sneakers, uh, people stealing other kids' hundred dollar. I don't know how much they cost these days, and I don't even think they call them sneakers anymore. Uh, but it. That degree of popularity among parents is being reflected among Kenyan parents over corporal punishment. Well, I would say worldwide, one of our problems right now is we don't honor the mother and the father. We don't honor wisdom in the people who have uh, age on their side, so to speak. Uh, kids nowadays uh, only get their reason and their knowledge and uh influence from other kids their age and in as such i see society having some big issues 
Um, you know, nobody's brought up in the, in the tribal ways where you would sit at the feet of the tribal leaders and, and learn about things. And uh, now we have tribalism where your tribe is 25 years old and you can do what you want, when you want, and if or if not, you want. Wow. Crazy times, George. It'll keep us employed for a long time. All right, that's all the stories I got well, here. Did you have any? Well, we got, yeah, we had two others. One okay. we held over from last week, the Archbishop of Sudan, Sudan and Lambeth. Yeah, okay. We, we're at 50 uh, minutes. Let's do a quick five on, on the Lambeth one. Uh, should I stay or should I go now? Uh, we've talked about this uh, since the last Lambeth. Uh, was it 2008? That's a 10. Long time. I think it was pushed back. Or no. Well, whatever it was. It was yeah, a long, it was long time, time ago. ago. Long time ago. And, you know, what influence does the Global South or the, the continent of Africa or anybody who's not... Uh, Anglicanized have when they go to the, a Lambeth conference because the Lambeth conference and certainly the current instruments of unity reflect a liberal view of Christianity and a very liberal view of church orthodoxy. And so the Africans have tried for a long time and the Global South have tried to a long time to hold the course. How can we keep the Anglican communion accountable? How can we keep it on course and out of the press with bad things. And they've tried from time to time to uh, influence Lambeth because it's it's where most people think the voice of the church really is set. You're bringing all the bishops in and you're having a conference in England at the Mother Church, Kent University. And lo and behold, we should be able to influence how the church is conducted from Lambeth. The bishop should be able to, to to have some influence there. The bishops, the primates from Africa, at one point figured out how to do that for one Lambeth season. But since then, George, these Anglicanized white Europeans have figured out how to keep the microphones away uh, during the Lambeth conference and have kept the agenda away from those who want to keep the church on a orthodox heading. Archbishop of Sudan says, listen, we need to go there to have influence over the Anglican communion. Please join me. I'm going to go. Um, and the, his motive is right. But if he goes, I want to send him and the Global South and the continent of Africa who, who want to attend Lambeth with good instruction on what you have to do to be successful. Good intentions will not be successful uh, when you go to Lambeth. Good planning will. George, let's talk about the success of the past first. Lambeth 1998 was an unqualified success for the coalition of conservative Western churchmen and the Global South. They were able to achieve their objectives of stating clearly the uh, innovations on homosexuality practiced by the American church and the Canadians were not uh, in line with scripture mm -hmm. and the church's traditions. We just, that was wrong. And when George Carey was Archbishop during, and, and George Carey supported that at the Lambeth Conference. And when he was Archbishop of Canterbury for the remaining few years he had left, he towed that line. Then we had Rowan Williams and we had Kenneth Kieran come in at the head of the Anglican Consultative Council. Kieran um, was a liberal Irishman, is a liberal Irishman, and he was a bit ineffective and he chased the money. And whoever gave the money got the, uh, the attention and the Anglic and the instruments of communion Anglican Consultative Council moved left. And it was controlled by the American church, the Canadian church, and the English church, and the Hong Kong church, and others, the people who put in the cash to run the show. Same time, Rowan Williams, who was liberal on these issues and had, had spoke against the Lambeth 110 resolution, adopted a course of hearing what the primates had to say 
and then saying, I can't do anything about it because I don't have legal authority. Mm -hmm. And so we went through the Dar es Salaam meeting where the primate said to Rowan, you're going to the U.S. General Convention in New Orleans. Uh, I'm to the House of Bishops meeting in New Orleans. You need the, the to do Episcopal this. The Churches, Epis yeah, House of Bishops, yeah. yeah. And Rowan Williams, and he didn't do it. And he said, you know, I don't have the authority to do this. I can't tell you what to do. Same thing that Justin Welby said to the Ghanaians uh, last week. Mm -hmm. Then uh, Justin Welby came in and Josiah Dawa Farone came in at the ACC. And Josiah Dawa Farone is of Nigerian and background. He's a Nigerian bishop, but he's been disowned by the Nigerians. He's a turncoat as far as they're concerned. He's um, not, uh, well, he, for instance, he uses the phrase archbishop. Well, Nigeria does have internal provinces and he was elected an archbishop but then when the time came for him to be run again, he was defeated, which is very unusual. Usually once you get to be an archbishop, the way the African system works is you have that till you retire. He was demoted and was a regular old bishop again. Um, but they call him archbishop. And one of the things that Daiwa Faron took up from Kiran was that the Anglican Consultative Council was the Anglican Communion Office. There is no such thing under law or under Anglican tradition as Anglican Communion Office. Welby has encouraged that power grab by the ACC bureaucrats and has himself adopted the uh, play both sides against the other. And we saw that at the last, at the Canterbury Primates meeting. <laughs> where the meeting was quite clear, Munir and Nice and Glenn Ven Greg Venables and all the other guys, the uh, Nigerians, the Kenyan, I don't know if the Nigerians were there, but the Kenyans and uh, all these people lay down the law and we had an agreement as to what was going to be done. Then Justin Welby led the press conference and he picked the Archbishop of Hong Kong and the Archbishop of South Africa to accompany him, two liberals. They're non-white, but the Hong Kong church is very liberal. In fact, the Archbishop of Hong Kong is pro-Peking. He's, uh, he's an anti-democratic, he's a critic of the democracy movement. He's mm -hmm. a, I would say he was a stooge of the, Hong, of the communist government. I think that's fair. And, and the Archbishop of South Africa is, basically he's a politician for the Ashen, African National Congress who wears a collar. That's he really awesome. is not, yeah. he's really not a, a bishop in the way yeah. I would see a bishop. So that being said, and so in the press conference, they reinterpreted what was done and get Justin Welby was given the authority to implement. And so what did Justin Welby do? Well, the American church is going to be put on timeout for two years and we're not going to appoint Americans to any groups. Well, within a month, an American priest, uh, Mark, uh, I think McIntosh it was, he just recently passed away. Mm -hmm. from the Diocese of Chicago, was appointed to an uh, uh, inter-Anglican body mm -hmm. against the clear resolutions of the Anglican, of the primates. Well, Mark, though he was an Episcopal priest, he was living in England at the time. So that doesn't count. And the American church may not come to the next ACC meeting in Lusaka. Well, who was there? The American church. So Welby basically chose not to enforce some things and enforce other things. Now we come to the next lamp. Zika and Nigerians have said they're not going, the Ugandans aren't going, the people from Sydney aren't going, half of the Kenyans may not go, uh, half are going, the Rwandans I think are not going, Burundians are going. So Gafcon is mixed. The Congolese, the South Sudanese, and the Sudanese are going, as are the Pakistanis and others. And the Global South people are going. And Ezekiel Kondo, the Archbishop of Sudan in Khartoum, has said, look, we can put together again that coalition and we can win by sheer numbers. And because the arguments are on our side and the Bible's on our side and we can retake the heights that we have lost through to the bureaucrats. Now, one of the things he's pushing is Munir Nice's idea that the Archbishop of Canterbury no longer be the 
automatic head of the Anglican Communion or leader of it, but it'd be elected from within the primates movement. And he wants to do what was done in 1998. Now, it Jeff Walton uh, has uh, commented on this saying, too little, too late. And on one hand, he's correct, but on the other, we saw the success of 98, and that was due to staff work available of young, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed people like me, uh, who <laughs> um, knew how the who knew how to beat the English at their own games. Um, well, I'll give but, you a little vignette. Well, I, but here's the important point: the English have learned; they're not going to make the same mistakes they made in '98. You know, what do we do? We just got to keep the, we keep telling them, yes, 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 yes. We just, the, the English, the Western people want to make sure that whatever happens, we want to be the enforcer of the actions that the primates want to handle. When uh, you make Justin Welby, Rowan Williams, any Archbishop of Canterbury who says they don't have the authority, the authority to hold somebody else accountable, you have broken the system you just tried to fix and you made it worse. The solution is to set up a separate primate level accountable uh, mechanism. That is true. Mm -hmm. But until we get there, I would argue that you need to use the current system against the people who are abusing it. As I mentioned in the discussion of Ghana and laws, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, has a Ghanaian view of law when it comes to primate meetings resolutions. They're not <laughs> binding. They are what they are. Mm -hmm. The English, if you basically follow Robert's rules of order, and you say, uh, these are the rules that will govern these meetings and proceedings, and they're Robert's rules of orders. The Africans, by and large, are not schooled in them. Very few English bishops are, mm -hmm. but the staff are. And if you have a counter staff that can f basically use the rules of Robert's Rules of Order, for instance, to achieve control of the gathering, you can then say, okay, uh, enforcement will be set up in this body, not default to the ACC or to the Archbishop of Canterbury. But you can, by in other words, in judo, how you win is you focus on the opponent's weakness. Which, and sometimes that weakness can be their strength. The English are anal retentive about rules. Well, use the rules against them. And grammar. And grammar. You, you know, Justin Welby uh, decides that the rules, when it comes to following Lambeth 110, mean something for the Nigerians and the Ghanaians, but another thing for the Americans. Well, mm -hmm. use that against him. And it's perfectly possible. Now, one of the problems is that GAFCON has done a really poor job in building a second level tier staff. So if GAFCON just imports the current drones they have, uh, they're not going to achieve anything. Yeah, uh, they used to have a wonderful secretariat. They used to have a, uh, a lot of good middle management. Gone. I don't know. I don't know what happened there. Um, I think we can take up this discussion again in our next show. Uh, in the comment section, tell us your ideas on how to achieve uh, success using Robert R Rules or other at the next Lambeth for the Orthodox Church, for the African Church, the Global South Church. How can uh, we slowly retake control of the Anglican Communion, which is just, it's flapping in the wind. You know, every time there's a breeze, it goes that way and that way and that way. And we, we want to fix this church. We want to see this church move into repentance and become the vibrant church uh, that is not Protestant. It's, it, it's so much more. But we could discuss that another time. Can I make one little commercial announcement? Well, we didn't talk about this. So what? what, what, what? Anglican Inc is looking for diocesan correspondents. If you would like to, we can't pay you. No, uh, it's you'll, get pay, you'll get paid as much as Kevin and I do. How's that? Uh, <laughs> you'll get paid as much as the boss. Uh, we're looking for diocesan correspondents to write about diocesan conventions, to write about issues of, of, of interest. No, not puff pieces. No, not how wonderful the, the bell ringers, the St. Swithins are holding their 50th anniversary. They are? But 
they are well yes they are but <laughs> but anglican inc has been doing very well mm -hmm. and it's and it's been able to build quite a following and it and we don't have the money to invest to buy market share we don't have the money to hire professional correspondents around the globe so let's start with those people who follow us who write whose english is their native language and let's just you know take it to the next level with the depth and breadth not every story has to be uh, a home run park but you, you know but just like your local newspaper people buy it because they want to find out uh, what's happening at the town council meeting yeah and we're not just looking for press releases we're looking for good original content uh, about things happening in your province or in your diocese that you were hey I, I went to this meeting why don't I write one or two paragraphs about it maybe three or four send a picture and uh, you'll get published and being published in Anglican.inc is very desirable for conservative writers in the Anglican communion. So well, you'll you'll get on somebody's S list yes. in, at Lambeth Palace. <laughs> Somebody, so. yeah. it, it happens. All right, longest show we've done in a long, long time, George. Watch the timeline for more. That's a thing. I can't tell you to watch the timeline because now you're at the end of the episode. What good is it to watch the timeline when you're here already? I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 701 of Anglican Unscripted.